Well, good morning, brethren. It is a very great privilege to be able to share with you, and I don't take this lightly. And uh, I must admit, it was a difficult week for me trying to get all my thoughts together in this message, but I hope uh, it would be, as our brother prayed, for the edification of the church. Uh, please turn in your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Revelation, chapter 1. And I am going to read verses 9 to 20. It says here, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun, shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Amen. This is such a powerful picture that we are shown here. One that certainly inspires us to awe, to wonder, to worship, and much time could be spent delving into the details of our text, scaling the depths of this glorious, majestic, even terrifying picture of the exalted Christ. And while I'm going to say something about this, I, I am not going to go in depth into what we've just read uh, as far as the details in this message. This is my third uh, teaching on the book of Revelation. And for some of you who have not been here, I've been trying to go through some of this book. And I don't teach here that often, so I haven't really set out to do a verse-by-verse -verse exposition of the book. What I've been trying to do through this series on Revelation is help you get a, get a better grasp of the book, mainly by helping you see the bigger picture. This prophetic apocalyptic letter that we have here is full of many perplexing uh, images, visions, descriptions, and the temptation can be, get to, can be to get caught up with the minute details. You know, what, what does 666 refer, refer to? Now this star, wormwood, that falls to the earth, that contaminates the waters, what is that all about? And how does that apply to today? And how is that fulfilled today? You know, we can get distracted with all the finer points and miss the forest for the trees. But if you want to begin to understand this book, you need before anything 
to get the bigger picture. And I've attempted to give you the bigger picture. Thus far, I've shared with you what the purpose of this book is, and I've shared how it communicates truth to us, namely through symbolism. And I've even told you a little bit about how this book is structured, the patterns, the parallels, the chiasms that we find in this book, its literary structure, and even its connection to the Gospel of John, how it's intricately connected to John, and one book can be used to interpret the other. It's amazing. And I'm not going to re reiterate everything I've said. Uh, if you want, you can go back and listen to the other messages online if you want. The good news is we've gotten through all the technical stuff, so <laughs> thank God, right? But previously, we've seen that the central theme of the book is the Lord Jesus Christ. From the very first verse of this book, we see that it is a revelation, an apocalypsis, a disclosure, an unveiling of Jesus Christ himself, his person, his worth, his redemptive work, past, present, and future. And especially, we see his future victory. Revelation is about the triumph of the Lamb. We're shown this triumph. In the end, Christ coming back. Christ coming to redeem his people. To bring about judgment, but also to save those who are his. And we see this great union between the bride of Christ and the bridegroom. That's essentially the message of this book, brethren. Jesus Christ and his redemptive work. And we also see that in this book, another major theme is perseverance. Revelation as a whole is a message, an exhortation to the church, to the bride of Christ. It's a call for us to endure until the end in spite of what we suffer. And we see here in this book that we suffer a lot. We will suffer. The church is, has already been suffering. I mean, even here in what we've read, John calls himself uh, in Verse 9, a companion or a partner in the tribulation. According to John, tribulation is not something that, that happens just right before Jesus comes back. Tribulation is now. It's here. And we are called to endure steadfastly. By clinging to Jesus Christ, by, by looking to Him and setting our hope upon Him and up, upon the future glory the grace that is to be revealed to us, our future redemption. And there are other major themes in this book, and I would like for us to focus on one in particular right now. It is a very important biblical concept that underlies the passage that we've just read. And it is this, it is the concept of holy war. Holy war. Now, you may be wondering, what, what does holy war have to do with our passage? Where in our passage is holy war mentioned? I mean, I don't see it explicitly there anywhere. Well, hopefully it'll all make sense shortly as we get through this message. But I guarantee you and I assure you that we see holy war in this passage. Maybe not as explicitly as in other parts of the book, but it's there. In fact, this theme permeates the whole book of Revelation, and it's found in the very heart of the book itself. As a matter of fact, the very reason this book was written was because of the reality of holy war. Now, you may be wondering, what, what, is, what does that mean? What is holy war? This, this term can conjure up thoughts of very unpleasant things in history. The Crusades, uh, Isla Islamic Jihad, religions that have tried to spread each other by force, you know, Roman Catholicism and its attempts to convert by the sword. I assure you, brother, I'm not referring to anything even remotely close to that. In John 18.36, speaking of parallels, John 18.36, the parallel book to this one, Jesus makes the good confession before Pilate. And he says that his kingdom is not of this world. Otherwise, his servants would fight, 
would fight to free him. But no, he came to, get, to lay down his life. His kingdom is a heavenly, spiritual one. And it's not advanced through the sword. And those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Scripture makes it very clear. We do not wrestle against flesh and blood. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. What I'm talking about right now, what I'm referring to has nothing to do with physical violence. Holy war is a spiritual battle, it's a spiritual conflict. And in order for us to understand what I'm talking about, I want to show you three things. First of all, the nature of holy war. Secondly, the backdrop of holy war. And thirdly, the outcome of holy war. We see this very clearly in the book of Revelation. We see this in our text. We see this in the first chapter as well. So let's start with the, the first point that I have, the nature of holy war. Brethren, whether we like it or not, absolutely every one of us here are in the midst of a fierce battle. A war rages on right now. Imperceptible to the human senses and to carnal reasoning. And nevertheless, it's real. It's as real as I am standing right here in your midst. There's an unseen spiritual realm and spiritual forces that are, that are at work at this very moment. Though this war is imperceptible to our physical senses, we can certainly feel its effects. Every single day there are victories. There are casualties. There are slaves of sin that are further enslaved to sin. Slaves that are judged and damned and lost. On the flip side, everyday souls are entering into the kingdom. They're pressing in. Righteous saints conduct spiritual warfare every single day through their lives, through worship, mortifying the flesh. Presenting their bodies as a living sacrifice of worship to the living God. As a matter of fact, brethren, what we're doing right now is an, act, is an act of war. The eschatological, the end times gathering of the saints for worship in the name of Jesus is spiritual warfare. And the book of Revelation clearly sets forth this battle. There are many things in this book that are hard to understand, but this is not one of them. From beginning to end in this book, we see we are made aware of the unseen spiritual realities and the great battle taking place between two kingdoms, the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and the kingdom of this world that is passing away. We're showing the players in this conflict the origin of the conflict, the consequences of this conflict, and the victor of the conflict. And we learn how to be on the winning side. From the very first chapter, we are awakened to this reality. From the very onset of this letter, we are brought in with John into the heavenly realm, the heavenly dimension. And this invisible conflict is made plainly visible. So we get an experience here in, in Revelation, similar to that of Elisha's servant in 2 Kings chapter 16. Our eyes are opened and we see the heavenly realities. We see the heavenly hosts and we see our heavenly Savior. God opens up the unseen realm to John here. And John encounters unimaginable things that I could not see, ear could not hear, heart could not perceive unless it was revealed from above. In verse 10, we see that John is in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Now, presumably, this is a reference to the first day of the week, but I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus in on in the in the Spirit part. In the Spirit, what does that mean? Look up this phrase in the New Testament. In the Spirit. At a minimum... If you compare this with the language of the New Testament, this is a reference to be, being under the influence of the Holy Spirit, being led and guided by the Holy Spirit. John was likely praying or meditating on the Word. 
But here in, in Revelation, we get the feeling that that's not all, right? We, we see something beyond that occurs in the context. And furthermore, we see that this in the spirit terminology echoes the language of the prophet Ezekiel when he was spiritually raptured and he saw heavenly visions. And I think this phrase refers to that as well. Not only under the influence of the Spirit, but taken up by the Spirit. John is somehow transported out of the earthly realm so he can see things from God's perspective. The heavenly realm is opened up to him. Can you imagine that happening? I mean, what, what if that happened to you? That this can be unbelievably wonderful. We would see wondrous things, but an experience like this could also be initially terrifying. I mean, we see things that we have not even been prepared to see. We hear things, sights, sounds, even colors that are, we have just not even imagined. It's like un unlike anything we've ever experienced. We witness things we can't, we can't even explain. That's, you know, that, that would be a, a, a terrifying experience on, in one sense. But we see here that John has this amazing, mighty, wondrous, awesome experience, and God shows up. John here is a mighty voice like a trumpet. This is reminiscent of what Moses heard on Sinai. John comes face to face with the majestic Son of Man through this vision. In verses 12 through 16, we, we, we see the Son of Man described. And this vision of the Son of Man utterly drains him of any strength, of any courage, and he falls down. Falls on his face. To the point where the Lord Jesus has to strengthen him. Hey John, it's me. Do not fear, it's me. But you know, that, that is the initial instinctive reaction of man in an unglorified state. Our, our bodies are not yet equipped. We are not yet equipped to be beholding such glory and such majesty. One day we will be. And we see the Son of Man walking among the seven lampstands, reminiscent of the lampstands in Israel's temple which are symbolic of the seven churches. And in turn, that is representing the whole church. And he's holding in his right hand seven stars. These are symbolic of angels, we're told, in the text. Now, some people believe that, uh, some conclude that there's reference to angels. The angels of the seven churches is a reference to the pastors or the ministers of the churches. You might have that conclusion. I, I personally have a hard time with that, and I'll explain to you why. Because in the book of Revelation, uh, the word angel is always connected to he you know, heavenly beings. I, I don't see another use of this uh, addressing uh, or, or speaking of mere men, mere mortal men. And I don't have a... Uh, all the time to, to get into all that right now, but at any rate, we do see angels in this book, don't we? We see the heavenly realm, and we see angelic beings. They are throughout this whole book from beginning to end. From the very first verse, we see the agency of angels, the mediation of angels. Jesus Christ, his revelation is given by Christ himself to John, and it's given through an angel. And at the end of this book, book in Revelation twenty two sixteen, it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. So Jesus sends his angel. Again, we're told that he sends his angel to bear witness. That's very important. Angels bear witness of what goes on in this world. And more specifically, bear witness of what goes on in the church. And we see angels throughout this whole book. We see heavenly beings in Revelation 4 and 5. These creatures described with bizarre language. 
these four living creatures that worship the Lord. We see other angels in these chapters. The heavenly creatures are linked with the other cycles of the book of Revelation. With the seals, with the trumpets, with the bowls. They are actively involved in everything that goes on in this book. They communicate with John. They worship the Lord. They make announcements. Bottom line here, brethren. There is a very real world of heavenly hosts. Angels are real. Heavenly spirits are real. Now, this is something that it, in the broader quote-unquote, reformed world, many do not like to talk about. We have become influenced by rationalism and naturalism more than we realize. But you'd be surprised. I mean, read some of the Puritan works. You'd be surprised of what they say about angels. The agency of angels. And the involvement of angels in the affairs of man. I mean, read some of the reformers. Read the Puritans. Read Jonathan Edwards. What he had to say about angels in the supernatural world. We in our day have not only become rationalistic. We've become reactionary. Some of us have come out of the, the charismatic camp. The charismatic world. And we go the other extreme. Right, And we don't want to talk about the spiritual things. We're afraid, we're deathly afraid of the supernatural, lest we be looked upon as some crazy hyper-charismatics. But the spiritual world, brethren, is real. There are angels. I would even dare say there are angels here, or at least beholding our worship as a church. We see this all throughout the New Testament. We, we are told specifically to do things and not to do things in light of the angels. There are some very seemingly strange passages. I think, I think of Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. Talking about women and head coverings and all that. I won't, won't, definitely won't get into that. But he, he says because of the angels. What women ought to have a sign of authority on their head because of the angels. What on earth does that mean? At the very least, we know angels are watching. The angels are beholding us. Read Matthew 18.10. Read 1 Timothy 5.21. But there are other supernatural beings as well that are watching us. That are around. The book of Revelation makes it very clear that there is one who seeks to destroy us. The prince of this world. There are principalities, there are powers, there are rulers of the darkness of this age. There are spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places, as it says in Ephesians chapter 6. There are demonic, unclean spirits that seek to destroy us. Now, this is not explicitly mentioned in chapter 1, but in the next chapters, we see this. Jesus very clearly mentions this in the, in the message to the seven churches. He talks about Satan. He talks about Satan's throne. Synagogues of Satan. He talks about the deep things of Satan. He mentions the emissaries, the human emissaries of Satan, those who are being used by Satan to persecute the church and to spread false doctrine. And in later chapters, especially in the seven trumpet section, the demonic forces are more frequently described. They are described as a great star fallen to earth. Described as ugly, terrifying locusts or scorpion-like creatures that inflict incalculable harm on unbelievers. Described as, one of them is described as Abaddon or Apollyon, the angel of the bottomless pit. Later on, we're told of unclean spirits who are like frogs, hearkening back to the exodus, exodus imagery of the plagues. And we especially see the conflict between these two forces. There is a conflict between the heavenly hosts and the demonic powers. 
at the very heart, the very center of this book. I explained last time how this book, its literary structure in the very heart and center of this book is Revelation chapter 12. And there we're given. We, we are told of the very origin and nature of this co cosmic conflict. And Revelation 12 links back to the beginning of the Bible, the book of Genesis. There in Genesis we see the beginning of, of the conflict. Man created to worship God, created as a pinnacle of God's creation, created to serve as priest and king before God. He gives in to the serpent. He is called to reign and rule over creation, to exercise dominion, but he allows the serpent to exercise dominion over him. And the whole universe is spun into chaos. But then what does God promise? In Genesis 3.15, he promises to send the seed. The seed of the woman. The seed who would be bruised on the heel, but who would crush the serpent's head. Amen. And that, that is the first announcement of the gospel in Scripture. The coming of the Messiah. And many of us are familiar with that. But there's also another detail to this promise that is often overlooked. God says there will be enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the of the serpent. God doesn't only promise the coming Messiah. He also promises that there would be conflict, that there would be hostility between two kinds of people, those who are of God and those who belong to Satan. Those who are of their father, the devil, to use the words of Jesus in John 8. In other words, holy war is foretold from Genesis 3.15. And this conflict is played out very vividly in Revelation chapter 12. We have this vision of a woman giving birth to a son and the dragon being there waiting to devour this son, this child. And we see war in the heavenly realm, Revelation chapter 12, starting with verse 7, and, and war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. The dragon loses. Through the gospel, he is defeated, cast out of heaven, cast out of the heavenly places, comes to earth. And then we see in Revelation 12, second part of this, well, we can, we can begin from the beginning of the verse, actually. Revelation 12, verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you, having great wrath, because he knows that he has a short time. Verse 13. Now when the dragon saw that he had been cast to, earth, to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. Finally, verse 17, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. There are so many details in there, too many for me to get into. But again, we see this bigger picture, don't we? Jesus Christ has triumphed through the gospel. Satan is angry. Satan see, seeks to do us harm. S Satan seeks to destroy us. Satan seeks to persecute the church. This is what's happening now. It's been happening for the past 2,000 years. And we must be aware of this, brethren. Satan walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And we are called to be sober and to be vigilant. Again, brethren, I, I know some of us have come out of this maybe Pentecostal, maybe charismatic background where people would see a demon under every rock. You know, you have a, a problem with sugar, eating too much sugar. Oh, you got a demon of, of sugar. You got a demon of chocolate. You need to be delivered. You need to go to this deliverance minister because he's the only anointed one who can do it. You can't do it yourself. You know, you can't fight the good fight yourself. You can't, you know, 
wrestle against principalities. You need somebody else to do it for you. We've come out of a background like this, some of us have, and, and, and we swing the other way. The other way of the pendulum, right? We go the other extreme. We don't, have, we don't want to have anything to do with demons, with Satan. But again, brethren, if you just take the truths that were told in the New Testament about Satan, about demons, about the reality of spiritual warfare, you'd be surprised about how often we're told about this. We need to be aware of this every single day. We're told to fight against Satan, to resist the devil. We're told to equip ourselves with the armor of God. So we ought to be vigilant. I'm going, I'm going to move on to the second point. This, these next two points won't be as long as the first one. The backdrop of holy war. So we see the reality first. We've seen the reality. There is a holy war going on. A holy war that is as old as the beginning. And Revelation as I said, links this concept to Genesis. And in fact, the book of Revelation is the conclusion of Genesis. It's the concluding story, the end, the last chapter. What, Je what began in Genesis is concluded in Revelation. We have the finishing part of this great redemptive story. But you know, the, the theme of holy war is not limited to Genesis. We see it in Genesis, not only in Genesis 3.15, we see it all throughout the book. We also see it in other parts of the Old Testament, especially in the story of Israel. This theme of holy war is more focused upon and elaborated upon in the story of Israel and their conquest of Canaan. And there, in the conquest of Canaan, we actually do see physical violence, right? We see a physical battle. Israel was called to defeat the Canaanite nations. The Lord had promised to Abraham the land of Canaan as an inheritance. But there is only one problem. The land was filled with various people groups that were unbelievably wicked. They were full of perverse abominations. They partook of the worst kinds of murderous, idolatrous, sexually depraved practices imaginable. They would sacrifice their children, among many other wicked things. They were so evil... That in Leviticus, they are described, well, actually, the land is described as a, about to vomit them. God had patiently waited for 400 years until they filled up the measure of their abominations. And now he was going to use the nation of Israel. Israel was going to be his instrument of judgment upon these Canaanite peoples. And through Joshua, the next in line after Moses dies, they are commanded to exterminate, utterly wipe out all these peoples. To wipe them off the face of the earth. Now, these are the portions of scripture that are the most criticized by unbelievers, by skeptics, by atheists. They love to point out the holy wars of Canaan. And they love to label God as a genocidal tyrant among some of the nicer things they say. But as I mentioned, the extermination of these Canaanite peoples was judgment. It is a holy God's prerogative to judge a wicked people the way he sees fit, including by using another nation to judge them. It's his prerogative to cleanse a land of defilement, especially if he wants to use that land for his dwelling, for his presence. We must look at these events of holy war in the Old Testament through spiritual lenses. This was not about ethnic cleansing in the physical sense. It was not about Israel being a superior people to the other peoples. In fact, God repeatedly reiterates, he tells the Israelites that he has driven out the nations. He's given Israel this inheritance, not because of them, not because of their merit, not because they were better than these people, but because of his own namesake. And simply because he loved them. It's all about him and his character. And as I said, this land was to be the dwelling place of God. 
His temple presence was to be in this land. So it, it needed a spiritual cleansing from defilement. Apart from that, these nations posed a great threat to Israel. They threatened to harm Israel. They threatened to contaminate Israel. If Israel had mixed with them, not only would they, they be spiritually defiled, but also this would threaten the coming of the seed of Abraham. He had to come through the line of Judah. So we must look at this holy warfare, this, uh, this uh, holy war that's conducted in Israel's times in, uh, through, through spiritual lenses. And we must also look at this as something unique that happened only in Canaan. We're not told anywhere else in the, in the Old Testament. That, you know, God doesn't say to Israel anywhere else in the Old Testament that they are to exterminate all the other kingdoms of the, kingdoms of the world. They, they, in fact, I would argue they weren't to exterminate those kingdoms. They were, they, would, they, they were supposed to win those kingdoms. They were supposed to be light to those kingdoms, to the rest of the world. This only takes place in the land of Canaan. We must look at this as judgment from God against sin. We must, must look at this as spiritual warfare. We must look at this as a heavenly battle. The forces of heaven against demonic forces. There were deep-seated satanic strongholds that Yahweh was seeking to bring down. These people serve demonic gods. A lot of weird stuff goes on in these nations. And by defeating them, Yahweh was demonstrating his victory and his lordship over the gods of the nations. Amen. This is heavenly war. And finally, we must see this as typological. The holy wars of Canaan were typologically foreshadowing the greater spiritual battle that we see in the book of Revelation. Some theologians talk about the intrusion, meaning that final judgment intrudes into history for a moment in time there in Canaan. We, we get a glimpse of the final judgment, the judgment to come. What happened in Canaan was a glimpse, was a prefiguring, foreshadowing the final judgment. It was a small picture of what we see in Revelation. And this is especially true of Israel's first conquest of the land. I don't know if you've ever stopped to consider this. The book of Joshua has a lot of parallels with the book of Revelation. Okay. I'm going to explain why right now. And I would just ask you to listen carefully. Don't lose track. This is so important. See if you can find the parallels in the story of Joshua, particularly, I'm going to zoom in on the story of uh, the downfall of Jericho. After Moses dies, Joshua becomes the leader of God's people. And the first city they need to conquer is Jericho. Jericho is described as a great city with impenetrable walls. Joshua sends two spies into the great city where they encounter a prostitute associated with Scarlet named Rahab. Ironically, the, the most unclean woman in the city, or one of the, a very unclean woman in the city, is the one who ends up helping these two spies. She hides and protects the spies. She demonstrates faith in the one true God of Israel. Amen. And they promise to save her and her family if she lets down a scarlet cord down her window when they come to destroy the city. She tells the spies to hide in the hills for three days and then be gathered back with their people. And when they, when they return, Joshua sets out to conquer this great city. But according to the story, the people need to get prepared first before conducting holy war. They need to consecrate themselves according to the ceremonial laws of purity. They need to be ritually clean. Then they cross the Jordan on dry ground. The Jordan parts and dries up and we see another connection to the, to the Exodus and a symbolic picture of baptism, I would argue. And the Ark of the Lord goes before them, symbolizing God's presence among them to fight for them. And that generation gets circumcised. They weren't circumcised. Moses failed in circumcising that generation. Ironically, how he, and interestingly, how he failed, a similar way he failed to circumcise his own children, and he almost died for that. 
So they need to get circumcised, and then they celebrate the Passover. So th this is all a sign of you know, d doing what the Lord wants and worshiping the Lord the right way, the way that he wants, ritual purity, ceremonial cleanness, etc. And right before going to battle against Jericho, the captain or the commander of the Lord's army appears before Joshua with a drawn sword. Joshua realizes that it's God. And he falls on his face before him in worship. And then they go after Jericho. And at God's command, the army circles the city for seven days, once per day, with the Ark of the Covenant leading them. But on the seventh day, they don't just march one time, they march seven times around the whole city. And then they blast seven trumpets. Then they shout and the walls of the city come down. And then they set out to destroy Jericho. And to uh, destroy utterly everyone and leave the spoils, the treasures for the Lord. They're devoted to destruction for the Lord. Devoted to the Lord. But not before they call Rahab out of the city. They keep their word. And Rahab is called out of this great city. And she is saved, her and her family. And in fact, she gets married to someone from the tribe of of Judah, Jesus Christ uh, comes from her, from, from her, we see in Matthew chapter 1. So you might, not, might ask, what does all this have to do with the book of Revelation? Well, hopefully you've caught some parallels. The translation of the name Joshua in the Greek language is Jesus, Jesus. In this book of Revelation, you also have a great city. You have two witnesses sent into the city who die and after three days are raised up. The city represents the kingdom of the world. And like Joshua, you have a series of telescopic sevens. By telescopic, I mean like a telescope it pulls out seven and then which leads to another seven, which leads to another seven. Seven seals lead to seven trumpets, which lead then to seven bowls. And the only other place in the Bible, apart from Joshua, where you have seven trumpets, is here in Revelation. In Revelation 11, the city falls in an earthquake. Then there is a seventh trumpet blast, which is followed by shouts from heaven. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Revelation 11:15. Then the Ark of the Covenant is revealed in heaven in Revelation 11. Revelation 17 to 18 also fills us in on the destruction of Babylon, described as a harlot with scarlet. But also in Revelation 19, we see the picture of a bride. The bride of Christ was called out of the world. The ones who were of this great city are called out. They lived among this system of Babylon, but they, are, they were saved. And in fact, in Revelation 18.4, we, we see this calling. Come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins, and lest you receive of her plagues. God's elect are called out of the system of this world. And there are many other parallels. We could go in depth with all these parallels. I, we don't have time for that right now. This week I was reading Joshua, just seeing the parallel language, parallel concepts, parallel terms in the book of Revelations. Some theologians, uh, some people believe that uh, the key to understanding Revelation is the book of Joshua. Um, I would agree, but I, I would also say the key to understanding Revelation is also Daniel and Ezekiel and Genesis and Exodus, <laughs> all the books of the Old Testament. It's not limited to Joshua, but... Joshua can help us understand this book in a better way. The bottom line is this, brethren. Joshua was foreshadowing holy war. The holy war that we are presently in. And I hope that in light of this, the text that we've read makes sense. There's a parallel that I didn't mention. Well, I mentioned that right before they go into Jericho, the captain of the Lord's army appears before Joshua. But I want to ex explicitly say this, brethren. The same or a similar experience, at least, happens here in Revelation chapter 1. 
the commander, the captain of the Lord's army, appears before John. He's not holding a sword, a two-edged sword is coming out of his mouth. And John falls before him. So what is this telling us? Jesus is preparing his people for holy war. Jesus comes to announce the holy war, to assurance of his, of his presence in this holy war. And assurance of the victory. Christ is preparing us for conquest. Which brings me to the final point. And this will only be a few minutes. The outcome of holy war. You also have the outcome. That's laid out here in Revelation chapter 1. Christ not only calls us to battle. He calls us to victory. There is war language that flavors this whole chapter. And especially the reality of Christ's victory. In verses 5 and 6, 6 of this chapter. It says, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and, made, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Last time I, I was up here, I showed you how this uh, verses 1 to 11 forms kind of a chiastic structure in the very heart of this is verses 5 and 6. That's the main point. We could even say that this is the main point of the whole book. God wants us to see this. Jesus Christ is the faithful witness. He is the firstborn. He has supremacy over all. He has... Uh, he is a ruler over, over the kings of the earth. And he loves us. And actually, I would say that the main point or, or uh, the, the point of this chiasm here is the second half of chapter five, which says to him who loved us and, ha and washed us from our sins in his own blood. This is what God wants you to know from the book of Revelation. God loves us. Jesus Christ loves us. And he has come to conquer he has dominion over all the kings of the earth. But how did he gain this dominion? How did he gain this triumph? By laying down his life for us. And rescuing us from spiritual bondage. From spiritual Egypt. From spiritual slavery, slavery to Babylon. And he has made us a kingdom. He has established his kingdom. His mighty kingdom. That will never end. We are a kingdom of priests. Kings and priests before him. And in verse 8, the Lord calls himself the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and also the Almighty. And that is significant. Because often in the New Testament, this title Almighty, and also in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, uh, this word replaces the Hebrew word, the Lord of hosts. So the Lord of hosts in the Hebrew Bible is translated in the Greek, the Lord Almighty. The Lord of hosts refers to the Lord being uh, the Lord of the heavenly armies. It's a military term. It's a term of kingship. It's war language. And in verse 13, Jesus Christ is called the Son of Man. And that harkens back to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7 describes... The son of man who conquers the beast, who comes with the clouds of heaven to the ancient of days and is, is exalted above all and obtains an everlasting dominion and an indestructible kingdom. So when Jesus is called the son of man, that's what you should think about. Christ has conquered. Christ has obtained the victory. And in verses 12 to 16 of the first chapter, we get this glorious symbolic picture of Jesus Christ. And by the way, I have to emphasize, this is a symbolic picture. It's not meant to be taken literally. Christ does not have a literal sword coming out of his mouth. I won't get into the details, but Christ is depicted basically as a priest king. A priestly warrior judged. We're told about his clothing, about his head, about his hair, about his eyes, about his feet, his voice, his right hand, his mouth, his face. He's clearly arrayed in priestly, king, priestly and kingly garb. And we see his splendor and his holiness. 
we get a picture of him also as a judge coming in judgment, coming with penetrating eyes of fire to discern the hearts of men, coming to crush his enemies, especially with these feet of burnished brass or bronze, glowing hot feet. And as if all this weren't enough, in verses 17 to 18, it says this. Jesus himself says this about himself. Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. He's calling himself God. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Christ is portraying himself as the one who has conquered. He has even conquered over hell itself. The gates of hell have not been able to prevail against him. And at the very end of this book, we see this glorious picture of the word of God coming on a white horse to conquer, to crush his enemies. We see this, what, what is described here being fulfilled in a final sense. He comes to, to conquer his enemies and to save his people. So we're given here in Revelation a description of the Holy War. We're reminded of the reality of the Holy War. Revelation connects back to the Old Testament. We're given the, the background of this Holy War. And we're also told of the outcome of this war. So what is the point of everything I have just shared with you? Brethren, look unto Jesus and persevere. Every single sermon on Revelation is going to be about, about that. Look unto Jesus and persevere. Christ has conquered. Amen. When we go outside these doors, let us go out conquering and to conquer. For Jesus has conquered. Cling to him and you will be safe. Look unto him. Gather your strength and your grace from him. And he will give you the victory. He will give you the momentary victory over sin. He will give you the strength to endure until the end. Let's pray.